Good morning. Good morning. I don't know if anybody noticed, but we are in the middle of summer. Because it's hot outside. So although we are peeling layers as the summer goes on, the depths of the warmth of the Holy Spirit inside us burns as hot and as bright as ever. Can I get an amen? amen. I can tell all the energy, the heat has sapped all your energy and enthusiasm out. Let's see if we can cause that fire to burn a little bit brighter. Turning to number 525 in the Red Book of Common, in the Blue Hymnal. <laughs> Woo! Number five. It's We're going to sing. Right. Uh, it's hot all right. It's hot all right. And some of us have been in the heat just a little bit too long. 525, we're going to sing verses 1, 2, 4, and 5. And verses 1, 2, 4, and 5. Number 525. Uh, you're going to make sure that I'm right all day long, right? Sure. Good. Please stand. <laughs>
he's going to go through all five verses regardless of what we have to say. 55? 3.55, right two. Yes, sir. Are you sure? Okay, good. You know that it's like this past the Yeah, okay. You got that. Holy Eucharist, right two, begins on page 3.55 in the Book of Common Prayer. Page 3.55. At the top of the page, blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Page 356, the glory. Together. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, Almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world.
and the weapons of war perish. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The psalm appointed for today is Psalm 130. The psalm is found on page 784 in the Book of Common Prayer for your Lord. Let us pray Psalm 130 responsibly by O verse. I will begin. Out of the depths have I called you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears consider well the voice of my supplication. For there is forgiveness to you, therefore you shall be feared. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits for him, and his word is my hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen in the morning, more than watchmen in the morning. For Israel waits for the Lord, for the Lord has mercy. With him there is plenteous redemption, and he shall redeem Israel from all their sins. Our second lesson comes from the second letter to the church in Corinth, chapter 8, verses 7 through 15. The reading is found in your online bulletin, the Bible, and on page 941 of the Pew Bible. A reading from 2 Corinthians. Now as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all those eagerness, and in all our love to you. So we want you to excel also in this generous undertaking. I do not say this as a man, but I am testing the genuineness of your love against the earnest earnestness of others. For you know the generous act of our Lord Jesus Christ, that through, though he was rich, Yet for your sakes he became poor, so that his, by his poverty you might become rich. And in this manner, I am giving my advice. It is appropriate for you who began last year not only to do something, but even desire to do something. Now finish doing it, so that your eagerness may be matched by completing it in according to your means. For if the eagerness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not, in, not according to what one does not have. I do not mean that there should be relief for others and pressure on you, but it is a question of fair balance between your present abundance and their need, so that their abundance may be for your need in order that there may be a fair balance. As it is written, the one who had much did not have too much, and the one who had little did not have too much. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Christ, according to Mark. Glory to, you, Glory to you, Lord Christ. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered around him, and he was by the sea. One of the leaders of the synagogue, named Jazarus, came, and when he saw him, fell at his feet and begged him repeatedly, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come, lay your hands on her, so that she may be made well and live. So he went with him, and a large crowd followed him and pressed in on him. Now there is a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for twelve years. She had endured much under many physicians and spent all she had 
and she was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak, for she said, If I but touch his clothes, I will be made well. Immediately her hemorrhage stopped, and she felt in her body that she had been healed of her disease. Immediately, aware that power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? His disciples said to him, You see the crowd is pressing in on you. How can you say, Who touched me? He looked all around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, fell down before her, and told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, some of the people came from the leader's house and said, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue, <coughs> Stop, I need some water. <laughs> things that were given out to help us prepare for the future, and I brought some of those things 
with her. First of all, one of the things that you're going to need are cups, right? And you need the cups because they're going to help you with water. And if you don't drink enough water, one of the other things you might need is a bat. Okay. Now, the reason you need a bat is not is for protection. It's to defend you from okay. the other things you might need are lights, all right, particularly at night. So you crack these and they will glow so you can see where you are going. Especially not from you definitely from might need silverware to help you eat. You put yeah. these together, check them out. You put these together and you get a little four and you put this one together and you get a little spoon. And you put these together and you get a straw, right? It makes a longer straw, right? Sometimes the sun is too bright, you might need some sunglasses. Don't I look good? Yeah, I yeah, no. Okay. Sometimes you might need to take notes, right? So you might need a little notebook so you can write stuff down. Yeah, well, because I was taking notes yeah. while I was on my journey. Okay. You might need to remember where you came from, right? And this is all about St. Nicholas. Y'all remember St. Nicholas, right? Yeah. He was really a bit he was really cool. You might need some lip protection yeah. to keep, right? Because your lips get burned.
leader of, he's the, the dean of the Bishop's School for Ministry, raising up priests. I asked him, he went, <laughs> so there's a research project. There is a so major there's a major <laughs> research project that I have been working on since Lent. Since Lent I have been working on this. And I did ask it at a general convention because there were some people who are really in deep into this. Everybody's like <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> Next question, please. Yes, sir, in the back. At the conference you just attended, did you learn anything that was important to us? At, at the conference that I just attended, did I learn anything that was important to you? Baseball bat notwithstanding, because I got that at the Louisville Slugger <laughs> Museum. <laughs> if we spent as much time and energy as we did on all this stuff, if we spent all of this money helping the poor, Spreading the gospel, equipping churches, building homes, digging wells, letting people know who Jesus is. We'd be a whole lot better off. Amen. And the beautiful thing is, is I was not the only one who came away with that. If we spent the time on promulgating, evangelizing, and putting forth the message of salvation and forgiveness in Jesus' love, as we did debating resolutions on the placement of a V, or an A, or a comma in a resolution that nobody cares about, how much better off our church would be. We spent one full day trying to figure out how to put resolutions forth that we were then going to debate on for the next four days. And as I was sitting there with my delegation, and I thank God I'm in the delegation for the Diocese of the Rio Grande, because we collectively got it. But we are one of 107 different delegations. And we figured it out that at least in the Diocese of Rio Grande, Although we did do some really good work and we did do some things that was going to help make the gospel more approachable to people and so they could come into our churches and feel it and hear it and sense it. Although we did do some of that work, we spent an absorbent amount of time on shenanigans. And how we came away with we have got to do better. We've got to do a whole lot better. Because if we don't, all of the rest of this stuff is not going to make a bit of difference. When we recognize the people, the demographic of nuns, N-O-N-E apostrophe S, the group of people who have no spiritual or religious affiliation, they're not Protestant, they're not Catholic, they're not Orthodox, they're not Muslim, they're not Jewish, they don't belong to the Baha'is or any other. They are the nuns. They have no use, no need for anything to buy. Is the fastest growing denomination in the United States. And we are only one 
generation from the church dying out completely. One generation. Because God doesn't have any grandchildren. God only has children. We don't have nieces and nephews in God. We have brothers and sisters in God. And unless we really pull our heads out and start speaking the words of faith and love and hope and forgiveness and reconciling, we will truly become a lost generation. So what did I learn? You now know what you're going to hear from me for the next couple of years. We're going to roll up our sleeves and do what we say we're supposed to be doing. We're going to say the words that we're supposed to be saying. And for those of you, you radical introverts who are going, I can no more share my faith than I can grow an extra arm. You know what? That's okay. Because there's tools to help you show your faith even though you may not be so good at saying. But we're going to do it and show it. And you now know what you're going to hear from me over the process. It's going to be a broken record. But Jesus said the same thing to his disciples for three long years, and they didn't get it. Church has been trying to say the same thing for the last 2,000 years, and we didn't get it. But the hope is, is that we can and we will. Did that answer your question? <laughs> our bishop gets it. But our bishop is also, our bishop Michael Hunt, because he sat in on in several of our delegation meetings. And he was listening very intently. But the bishop's job is to help me. My job is to help you. The bishop can also help you, but there's a structure, right? If we had a deacon, then I'd be talking to the deacon, and the deacon would be talking to you as much as that I'm talking to you. But seeing as how I'm still a deacon in addition to the priest, we get to have this conversation. Yes, ma'am. Oh, who's our new presiding bishop? Sean Rowe. He is the yep, Sean Rowe is our new presiding bishop. He was elected on the very first ballot. He was the youngest person in the church's history to ever be consecrated as bishop. And he's also now the youngest person to be consecrated as presiding bishop. Um, I heard his words. I'll wait to see him in action. No, he's central someplace. Oh, is he central? I think he was someplace central. Maybe. But he's not Massachusetts. Might have been Massachusetts. He's someplace else. He's not ours. But who, who he is does not matter to us. He does not matter to us. Because he's not here in this part of the country doing the work that we have been called to do. Just like the people in Washington do not matter to us because they are living there, they're not living here, we still have to work to do the work that we here have to do. And what we have to do is clearly defined for us in Scripture. A lot of folks don't like to hear that. Don't take it up with me, take it up with God. Bump up any grade. Sir. Don't you think that Michael Curry, our presiding bishop, leaving in November, did a lot to bring Christianity into the world? For instance, when he preached at the uh, sermon for the uh, Royals, people didn't know anything about the Episcopal Church. And some people started saying, let me look into this church and see what it's about. I, I think those people have some 
members of this church. It's how we've been for hundreds of years. And uh, I think it's a good thing. Your point is well taken. People can look at him and then turn around and look at us. But if what they see there, they don't see here, it doesn't do any good. If Michael was, if it's not about love, it's not about God. Okay? If it's not about love, it's not about God. Trust me when I tell you, there is a lot that we do in the church that ain't about love. It's about politics. It's about policy. It's about my way or the highway. It's about Washington. <coughs> Excuse me. It's about my vision and how I read this. That is not about love. We may say it's about love, but who are we loving? Well, we're loving ourselves. We're loving our building. We're loving our own little enclave. We're loving our own little silo. We're not about loving what's going, loving who's out there and what we can do for them. So yes, Michael Curry did a marvelous job of allowing a magnifying glass to come in and shine on us. And we are better served because he was our presiding bishop. Following him, whew, I wouldn't want that job for love and money. Because nobody can preach like Michael Curry preached. <laughs> I heard three sermons from him while I was at the convention. And I was like, man, I just got to shut up and sit down because I got nothing. But unless I am doing what he says we need to do, unless I bring that home, which is what I'm trying to do, because he was about professing the gospel. He was about doing it in love. Loving your name. Well, what's that look like? I suspect that I would get about three dozen different answers if I asked that question in this congregation right here today. And some of those definitions would be in off-center from each other. And that's okay because we can still live in tension. And we can still continuously move forward. All right. Yes, ma'am. I have another question about where he's from. Erie County. Yeah, Northwestern Bishop was in Northwestern Pennsylvania and Western New York. Okay. I heard two sermons from him. I'll reserve judgment. Only because I don't know the man. Right? I don't know anything about it. Uh, Did you hear all of the candidates? Did I hear all of the candidates? Yeah. Yes. My choice was Rob Wright out of Atlanta. Yes. He's a great, great pastor. He's a great pastor. All of the candidates who had risen to the level of being uh, nominated and put on the ballot, as it were, were good people. I mean, you can't rise to that level, particularly when you let God lead the way and be off. Okay. So, yeah, we, we did have a really good slate. But the bishops elected, and they elected it overwhelmingly on the first ballot. It was like, you know, 200 and some and the next was like a hundred and some, and then there was like 90 some, and then there was like three. Yeah. <laughs> you know? um, yes and no. There are some presiding bishops we heard elections where on the 13th and 14th ballot, they finally decided to eliminate some people to, to narrow the choices. Um, when we elected Bono, <clears throat> if memory serves me correctly, it took us four or five ballots to elect Bono. It took us maybe two or so to elect Hun. So it depends upon who puts themselves forward and people hearing what they think they're hearing from the Holy Spirit. How long can you be bishop? He, uh, he can be bishop. Nine years, nine or 
15 years, the presiding bishop, there's a statute of limits, and I think it's self-imposed. I don't think it's in the canon. Because we've had between 12 and 9 over the last couple of presiding bishops. But you can't, like me, at age 72, you're out of there. So, our new presiding bishop, because he is as young as he is, he can serve presiding bishop, and then he can go back and be bishop or priest or do what he wants to for an extended period of time. The next general convention will be in Phoenix in the summer. <laughs> Our deputation was already making plans about how we were going to show forth what we were going to do, assuming A, that we would all run, B, that we would all be reelected. I have been told that I am not running, that I cannot be elected. The same person told me both. To go back again. Deputy. To go back again? Yeah. Yes, in, in Phoenix, in June, in the summer, in three years, with climate change, making it even warmer in the summer, in Phoenix. <laughs> Other questions? Yes, ma'am, in the back. You got an answer to the letters? Okay, then come down here. Come, come down here and share it with us, please, in lightness. And I'm having you come forward because your voice doesn't carry like mine from the back forward. Yeah. <laughs> and if we're all going to know, okay, I want you to turn around and who are you? I'm Laura. Everybody say, hi, Laura. Hi, Laura. Uh, okay, and you're relatively new to the congregation. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm keeping a distance yeah. just because I got this. You're good. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so Laura, what does the fount of all information tell you? <laughs> okay, so uh, the Sunday letter <coughs> um, identifies the days of the year when Sundays occur. Um, after every date in the calendar, a letter appears from A to G. Thus, if January 1st is a Sunday, the Sunday letter for that year is going to be A. And if January 2nd is a Sunday, the Sunday year for that letter is going to be B. What? What is the name? Yeah. But I guess I don't know how they, like, pulled out of that. And why do they capitals? Yeah, capitals. I don't know, because they have here A is a capital and G is a lowercase. So it says in leap years, however, the Sunday letter changes on the first day of March in such years when A is a Sunday letter. This applies only to Sundays in January and February, and G is the Sunday letter for the rest of the year. Okay, so what I'm hearing is, is, is that they've assigned these things in an order that's going to make sense to somebody, but for the rest of us, we're still going to be end up scratching our heads, I right? Think it's totally yeah, and it's not going to make any more difference <laughs> yeah, now. It's pretty complicated because then it says to find the Sunday letter, the following tables provide the reference to the Sunday letter of any year between AD 1900 and AD 2099. It will be found in the line of the hundredth year above the column that contains the year of the calendar. Okay, so send that to Lorenzo. Lorenzo's going to put the link in the bulletin. <laughs> and for those folks who really want to <laughs> dig and, and chew, in, chew on it, thank what you. Is that, what is that site? Because we looked at yeah. everything that we could. It's my ADD hyperfixation. I would have been able to focus on anything else this life. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so you were going to find, you were going to find an answer yeah. to this question. <laughs> 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 had to find, yeah. Thank you. BCPonline.org. Yay. BCPonline.org. BCP How did we not? <laughs> <laughs> no, you know what? You. you know what? You know the reason why I didn't? Because we needed Laura to find it so she yes. could stand up. Yeah. So we could yes. see her. Yes. Everything in yes. God's time is right. Can I share my yesterday? In a second. Okay. In, yes, sir. In places where the Curcio is viable in the church. Curcio is a movement, it's a week, it's an intensive weekend discovering who Jesus is in your life. It is an incredible experience. 
but it is more viable in dioceses where the leadership has promoted it and where it is where you have a great number of priestesistas so that you can gather for seal movements together. Short answer is not so much in the west, not so much in the far out dioceses where you have a lot of space between people, but in Michigan, in Minnesota, in Wyoming, uh, not not in Wyoming, but eastern and the coast where you've got better bigger concentrations of people. Out here in the west, not so much. In the diocese of the West Texas, where I came from initially, it was really big, and we uh, we, we we followed it. It's it's still viable there, but uh, I, I was just curious as to what's happening on the national level. You know, it, it's a fourth day movement, so it is a weekend for people like my wife and me who still follow the Casillo method now, making the friends, bringing the friends. Being a friend, friend to bring that friend to Christ. So we do that wherever we are, whether there's an organization here or not, we're going to be doing that. So. You know what I might have you do is at some point in time have you explain <coughs> if you have heard of uh, Crescio, raise your hand. If you've heard of it. If you've been to a Crescio weekend, raise your hand. Okay? You might, I might have you come up here and explain what the Curcio is, what the Curcio movement is, and if there is interest, if we can get together enough people in the diocese, we might be able to pull one together. I am not opposed to it. Um, it's, it is an opportunity because it is. Make a friend, then be a friend, bring a friend. But you got to make the friend first. And I think that is one of the issues that we have in our church. Is we have lots of friends, but we don't want to risk offending them by telling them about Jesus. We don't want to risk our work relationships by forcing our religion down somebody's throat. By sharing. Um, in, my, in my personal opinion. So, yes, let's, I, I have no objections to that whatsoever. I think it would be a great idea. At some point in time in the not so far distant future, uh, if you would put something together and we'll have you explain it and we'll see what we can do. Maybe we can do it for CO here in our church. Okay. And then take it, you know, maybe a CO in our deanery. You know, El Paso and then Las Cruces and do one of those here locally and then move forward. I'm down. That would be good. I'd love that. Other questions? Two last thing. <laughs> Y'all didn't see that. Richard, one last thing, and his wife reached over there, grabbed his hand, and put it down. <laughs> I am canonically resident in the Diocese of Milwaukee. The Diocese of Milwaukee, the Diocese of Montclair, and the Diocese of Fond du Lac joined, and that was solidified by this, uh, this weekend, I think. Yes, there were three. Wisconsin, the state of Wisconsin had three dioceses. Wisconsin is about a third the size of the Rio Grande. And they had three dioceses, and we got one, which is the largest geographic in the continental United States. So they took the three dioceses that were in and combined them in one. And it was much fanfare and hoopla and shouting. Part of the reasons why they did that, one was financial. Of the three dioceses, they only had one full-time resident bishop. They had an assisting bishop there, but there was only one full-time for the three dioceses. So now everybody got together and they're partying as one big happy family. So that was fun. And we, we allowed and welcomed in the missionary diocese of Navajo land. That they can operate as an indigenous people who have an Episcopal heritage. It's a big deal because the colonialism 
and the manifest destiny that swept across the country and ruined the spirituality and lives uh, of hundreds of indigenous people. The Episcopal Church has taken a step to say, we recognize you, we love you, you're going to do things as you see fit under the umbrella of the Episcopal Church. You're going to allow a bishop the way you allow a bishop to set up. And we welcome them in. So the next time, the next convention, they will be seated with voice and vote as their own diocese. And that was a, that was a very powerful thing. So we can talk more about the general convention at happy hour. Any other Bible-based questions? I had a, a thought. It was dangerous for me. You had a thought. <laughs> um, you said introverts are, it's hard for them to communicate. General broad brush. Yes. Actions speak louder than words. Mm -hmm. Our actions towards other people, whomever, whatever, need to be more pronounced. Mm -hmm. And if they ask you, well, why are you always so happy? Because I'm a believer. What do you mean a believer? That opens your door. We do it all the time. I've done it all my life. And it's, it's made a big difference in other people's lives. Yes. If they know we're Christians by our love, we love through our actions. We love here. We love in a smile. We love in an ear. We love in a connection. Y'all know I wake up like this every morning. <laughs> I take that out into the world by God's grace. And because of that, it enables me to open that conversation. To have people ask, why are you so happy all the time? But I, I, know, I know a guy. That's what you're talking about, really? Because you're definitely not an injury. <laughs> but you know, it's the it's the person it's the person who when you know, well you're so happy and you do all these great things for somebody, you know, why why are you like that? And the introvert in me says, I don't know. Instead of, you know, the what you said is, you know, I'm a believer. Right. That in an introvert that would never come out. That'd be like, I don't know, I just feel like doing it and that's it. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, you know what's inside of all of us. You put it there. Help us not block getting it out of us and get it into the world. May we be bold with your love, for your love, sharing your love in all the world. We need your help in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please stand. My brothers and sisters, the peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Please share that peace with those closest to you.
It's good to be home. Uh, it was good on some occasion, it was good on a couple of levels to be at the general convention. One of the things is the worship services, morning prayer, the Holy Eucharist were mind and spirit below me. To hear that many people praising God, raising their voices in song, to hear the sermons that were focused on what we needed to do was just incredibly uplifting to my spirit. Um, would I go again with my wife's permission? Absolutely. Um, and because it's in Phoenix, because it's in Phoenix, they have a need for a great number of volunteers. And Phoenix is only a hop, skip, and a jump away. So if you would like to go over and experience what the general convention is, they always are looking for volunteers. You can sign up and go and volunteer for a day or two or three and be on the floor or be around the convention hall and just get a sense of what the larger church impact is. Because we do have an impact literally around the world. Um, we're almost, we're close to the British Empire in that the sun does not set on a place where the Episcopal Church in the United States does not have an influence. It literally is all around the world. And that was impressive to see and hear. Everybody's got a bulletin in that bulletin. There's all kinds of good information. So please read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest it next, not next week, two weeks. In two weeks we have a vestry meeting. There's some stuff that we're going to need to discuss on the vestry meeting. So please put that on your calendar uh, to come. Birthdays and anniversaries, I know we got some. <laughs> you got a birthday, you got an anniversary, slide on down.
where they are committed to each other and to you. Be with them this day and always. We pray in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Oh, amen. Who are you? Richard. Everybody say, hi, Richard. Hi, Richard. And who are you? Marie. Everybody say, hi, Marie. Hi, And let's give him another round of applause.
Amen. My brothers and sisters, walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us and offering you. Oh, <laughs> thank you, Lord. All right, real quick, real quick. As you all know, I participated in the Sun City Pride Parade yesterday. Um, it was hard afterwards because I had a heat stroke. I got really sick. I just ended up throwing up and... Uh, anyway, but I feel a lot better today. And I want to share the fact that we were recognized as the Episcopal Church. Um, people have never heard about us. And they came to our booth at the park and they were asking all sorts of questions. And I got several people that came up to me and they said, you're Lorenzo, you're Lorenzo, we, I follow you or we follow you on Facebook. I said, yes, thank you for following me. But they were shocked when I said, now that you're following me, why don't you follow Jesus? They said, well, where's your church? And I told them, we have St. Luke's in Anthony. There's other churches that might be closer to you. And so it was a really good way of introducing the Episcopal Church to the, the people around there. Um, families, I mean, family would, would come up and talk to us and all that. And so it was a pleasure to do my ministry in that manner to talk to people, to go out there and, and see how many people are in need. Yes, Laura? I will second that. Um, I don't want to have a pattern of um, yesterday. And I think a lot of people have been talking about that. Yeah. Um,
that's why we were praying for him. Okay. Those boys that were up here, right, is who he's in charge of. There you go. But it's, it's the, that is the action that I see you saying that reach out, the welcoming that you have here, uh, being able to speak freely with you. I have not been in this town, but I'm extremely comfortable in this church. Uh, it's beautiful. Thank you.
Sanctify us also, that we may take 
page 366, page 366. Let us pray together. Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. Now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. May the peace of God which passes understanding Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of the Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you this day and always. Amen. One minor fact that I wanted to share with you about my time at convention, lest some folks in the diocese think that it's a nine-day vacation, I, who have a fairly large step, who cover great distances in short period of time, walk 105,000 steps over those nine days. That's a lot of miles. <laughs> because we walked everywhere we went. So, it's some work. Um, prayer, where are we? What are we? Some. Some, huh? 450, all hail. 450. 450, all six verses. All, all six verses? Good. 